Here is the question that I ended the first part of this video lecture with, and there are many ways to understand the answer to this question. Here's one of them. Let's think about the potential energy of this pair of particles. It's given by the kq1q2 over r formula. And note that q1, q2 here is negative because q1 and q2 have opposite sign, and so we know the potential energy is negative. And what's more, it gets larger, by which I mean it has a larger magnitude, as r gets small, and the denominator of that expression gets small. That means, as these particles are brought closer together, the potential energy is getting more negative. Or, in other words, the change in potential energy is negative. Well, if the change in potential energy is negative, and there's been no change in kinetic energy, then the total change in energy of the system is negative, and that must be the work done by the external agent. Now, note, you might be a little confused about why the work done by the external agent could be negative. After all, this force supposedly perhaps carried Q2 from its original position to its final position. Wasn't it in the direction of motion then? Well, no, it wasn't at all, because Q1 is pulling on Q2. If we just release Q2, it'll accelerate towards Q1. But we've made it arrive at its new location with zero velocity, and so we must have been holding it back the whole way there. In other words, we were pushing away from Q1 the whole time. And so we can now see why that force would do negative work. We saw in video lecture one of this unit that we can define something that we call electric potential, and it's related to potential energy in much the same way that field is related to force. In other words, it can be thought of as potential energy per unit charge at a location in space. So let's now view our charge Q2 here as a probe charge and look at this in more detail. So I'll call it QP since it's a probe charge, and we've seen that the potential difference between points A and B is just the change in potential energy as we carry QP from A to B divided by QP, so that all dependence on the probe charge will drop out. And this is then a property of the points A and B, and we think of it as being produced by Q1. Alternatively, we could define it in terms of electrostatic work. Instead of thinking of the system of the charge, which is the source charge and the probe charge, we simply think of it in terms of the work done on a probe charge as we move it around. And then we know that the work done is the negative of what the change in potential energy would be for the system of charges. And so our potential difference is the negative of the electrostatic work done on our probe charge as we move it from A to B divided by the probe charge, again so that all dependence on the probe charge disappears. Once we know the potential difference between two points, it's easy to calculate the work done on any particle that moves from one of those points to the other, because we simply have to multiply by the negative of that charge. <clears throat> the reason I started off looking at potential difference and not potential is that where we set the potential to zero is arbitrary, because where a potential energy is zero is arbitrary. And so, since that's arbitrary, the actual value of the potential anywhere is arbitrary. It's really potential difference, which is meaningful, not potential. However, we often have a convention, as we've seen. For particles, we choose that the electric potential energy is zero when they're at infinite separation. And so that will also say that their electric potential will be zero at infinite separation by this convention. And so we get a simple expression for the electric potential at a point A due to a charge Q, and note that the probe charge, of course, has dropped out of the expression. 
as it must. This quantity must be independent of the probe charge that we use to measure it. And so, from now on, we'll tend to just think of a point A near any charge Q, and we can simply calculate the potential there due to the charge Q. Note that it only depends on R, and so it'll be the same everywhere on a sphere of radius R centered around the charge Q. In other words, the equipotential surfaces around this charge Q are spheres. And so we'll often tend to write this potential as a function of R to highlight that fact. Coulomb's law, we've seen, applies to uniformly charged spheres as well as particles. And we've also seen that the expression for E fields that we get for a particle also applies to a uniformly charged sphere. And we found the expression for electric potential due to a particle from the E field and force expressions, and so unsurprisingly it works for uniformly charged spheres as well. So let's find the electric potential on the surface of a charged ping pong ball. We've seen that it's fairly easy to get a one nanocoulomb or even a several nanocoulomb charge on a ping pong ball. A ping pong ball has a radius of about two centimeters, and so we can easily find the electric potential on the surface. So we see that under the convention that the potential is zero at infinity, the potential on the surface of the ping pong ball is about 450 volts. And that's for a ping pong ball with one nanocoulomb of charge on it. It's easy to get more than that on it. That might surprise you. The potential that you get from a wall socket is 120 volts. And you know that under some circumstances that can be dangerous. So why isn't one of these charged ping pong balls dangerous? Well, the quick answer is that what's really dangerous is the amount of energy stored in it. It's not really correct to say that the potential energy of the charge on the ping pong ball is just the charge times the potential, because now we're double counting that charge as source and probe charge. But it's going to give us the right order of magnitude. And so we see that we take 450 volts times the 1 nanocoulomb, and that's 10 to the 2 times 10 to the negative 7, negative 9 rather, and so we get about 10 to the negative 7 joules, which is minuscule, and so it's unsurprising that it isn't dangerous. What if we want to know the potential at a point A due to several nearby particles? Well, you would think, and you would be correct in thinking, that it's just the sum of the potentials due to each of those particles. But let's just quickly see that that's true. So we'll think of bringing a probe particle from infinity, and we'll calculate the electrostatic work done on the probe particle. And we know we can just add up works, because it's just work by individual forces, and that is the work of the sum of the forces. So we know how to calculate the work done by one electric charged particle on another charged particle. This is the expression. And we're starting at initial distances of infinity, and so the first term disappears. And so we're simply left with this. And we know that the change in potential is the negative of the electrostatic work over the probe particle. If we define the potential to have been infinity, or to have been zero at r equals infinity, then this just gives us the final V, which is the potential at A. And so all that happens when we divide by QP is all the factors of QP disappear, and we're left with this expression, which was exactly what we expected, the sum of the potentials due to each of the particles. 
This is going to be very useful to us, because we already know that when we just have sums, then we can deal with continuous charge distributions as well, because we can always think of a continuous charge distribution as being made up of a lot of little bits. Well, you know what's coming next, and that'll be the topic of the next video lecture.